Okay, so I'm quickly going to try to run through um, gestational diabetes, fear, um, and then you know, we don't have very much left. Um, gestational diabetes is glucose intolerance with the onset during pregnancy. Marie usually returns to normal by six weeks postpartum. Be sure that you see box 5, 4 on page 97 to have a lot more information um, about gestational diabetes. The stress of pregnancy puts a strain on a pancreas. It cannot keep up with the insulin demands. Signs and symptoms are glycosuria. Um, if you're not sure what that is, please look it up. Make sure you understand. Diagnosis occurs at 24 to 28 weeks. Well, diagnosis can initially occur at 24 to 28 weeks. So what happens between 24 and 28 weeks is patients get a glucose tolerance test done called a GTT, a glucose tolerance test. And um, they usually will get a one-hour GTT done first. And depending on the results of the one-hour GTT, if that one is elevated at all, then they will come back and get a three-hour GTT, a three-hour glucose tolerance test. And if that is still elevated, excuse me, then they would be diagnosed with um, gestational diabetes. The treatment is a low-carb diet, doing finger sticks, taking insulin, exercise, NSTs, hopefully you guys remember what NSTs were, non-stress tests, and kick count. All right, 35 to 50% women with gestational diabetes will develop type 2 diabetes later on in life. So it is something that needs to continuously be monitored. Infants born to moms with gestational diabetes, what? What happens with these infants that are born to moms with gestational diabetes, or what is different? So in this point, moms with gestational diabetes are, um, have what's called fetal macrosomia. They are large for gestational age. These are big babies, usually your 10, 11, 12 pound babies. Moms have generally have gestational diabetes. So they're fetal macrosomia. Um, immediately after delivery, infant point moms with gestational diabetes will often be seen with hypoglycemia. These babies often have respiratory distress. And they could have injury from the macrosomia from being so large during labor. So they may have a fractured clavicle or have um, oxygen deprivation from being so large and trying to pass through the birth canal. All right, anemia is iron deficiency and folic acid deficiency. Hmm. Iron deficiency anemia. It's difficult for women to get all the iron they need from the diet alone. They will require supplement. They need iron related to increased blood volume, so transfer the blood to the fetus, and the expected blood loss during a delivery. Okay, normal vaginal delivery is estimated blood loss is about 500 uh, milliliters of blood. That's quite a bit. Vitamin C enhances the absorption of the iron, so we would recommend that patients um, use vitamin C, or I mean take uh, vitamin C with the iron. Now when you are taking iron supplements, one thing you want to be sure and tell the patients is to not take iron supplements with what? Okay, you guys remember this from pharmacology. Um, you don't want to take iron supplements with milk or an acid. And the piece of the purpose of taking the iron supplement because the milk and an acid um, decrease absorption of the iron. Folic acid is, oh gosh, what happened? Oh, the rest of my thing didn't come up. Okay, let me see. Uh, well, I'm just going to talk, I guess. Folic acid anemia. Cause it, it can cause anti, um, or the causes of folic acid anemia, what could cause folic acid anemia are things like taking anticonvulsants, anti-seizure medication, oral contraceptives, Sulfa drugs and alcohol, those can all lead to folic acid anemia. Patients need to have folic acid supplements. And the effects of the fetus, if there's folic acid anemia on the fetus, um, the effects are generally neural tube defects. All right, uh, we encourage all patients to start folic acid during the childbearing age, anytime before conception, anytime during that childbearing age, we encourage taking folic acid supplements so that you're prepared in case you get pregnant. Um, be sure that you see page 103, Nutrition Considerations. All right, next we have infections. I'm sorry about the PowerPoint, I'm not sure what's up. But with infections, um, 
one of the things we're going to discuss is TORCH infection, T-O-R-C-H. And what that stands for is, that's basically a mnemonic. So T is for toxoplasmosis. Uh, toxoplasmosis sometimes leads to serious eye and brain damage in the infant. O is for other infections. R is for rubella. It can have serious fetal effects. That's on page 104 in the book. C is for cytomegalovirus, CMV. These are usually an asymptic mother with serious effects for the baby, serious fetal effects. That's also on page 104. And H is for herpes simplex. We have type 1 and type 2 that can lead to fetal death. Again, this is on page 104. If the mom has active herpes, active genital herpes lesions, then she must get a C-section. You cannot deliver um, a baby vaginally if you have active herpes lesions because the herpes will contract to the infant during delivery. It can cause death. So that is very important to know. Uh, we don't have any more. Um, another infection we want to talk about is group A strep, GBS. Now, GBS is a normal flora for many women. It is found in the vaginal tract for many women, and that's normal. Um, most women is, are asymptomatic with it, meaning they don't have any symptoms. They do not have an infection. Group beta strep is not an infection because it is a normal flora for women. What happens, though, is if the mom has GBS, group beta strep, then when the baby delivers vaginally, that can infect the fetus during labor and birth and cause problems for the fetus. Again, it does not cause problems for the mom, she's not sick, she's not infected, but it can have bad uh, negative effects for the baby. Um, screening is done at 36 to 37 weeks gestation, it's done with a little vaginal swab. Treatment is going to be antibiotics during labor, usually penicillin, and preferably, preferably at least four hours before delivery, and they like one to two doses of penicillin to be done. Um, at least four hours prior to delivery. So when we get report on a patient, that's one of the labs that we check. And so we would get report and say that the mom is positive for GBS. And the very next thing I want to know is, was she treated or not? If she was not treated, I have to watch the baby very, very carefully. And the baby is more than likely going to have to have a, a lot of labs and a lumbar puncture and a lot of workup done um, to ensure um, the baby's health. Fetal effects can cause pneumonia, sepsis, respiratory distress, apnea, and meningitis in babies. All right, again, the diagnosis is done with these vaginal um, rectal swabs at 36 to 37 weeks gestation. All right, finally, we want to talk about substance abuse real quick. Substance abuse includes illegal drugs, tobacco, and alcohol. The fetus is at greatest risk during the first trimester, but it's still a very serious effect of the, on the fetus throughout the entire pregnancy. Be sure you um, look at page or table 5-9 on page 109. Um, some of the major ones to consider are alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, tobacco, anticonvulsants, and ACE inhibitors. Okay. Um, okay. So that covers that. Be sure and let me know if you have any questions because I won't see you guys again until the next test. So we'll have, um, I think this is a 25 question exam that will be based on just this one lecture because it's, it's a pretty detailed lecture. So please take the time, spend a lot of time in this lecture, um, understanding what's going on. All right.